Meet me in the 10th chapter of Matthew and let's get busy, all right? I know we only have so much time. I'd like that if we do conclude a little bit early, we may take some questions and see where we, see where we end up today as we conclude this weekend of meetings. And I want to, I'll meet you in the 10th chapter and we'll go, we'll go into a couple of verses, several verses, in fact, of, from the lips of our Lord. He, uh, what he does in this passage mirrors, and this is the reason that I'm in this passage, it mirrors a little bit of what I feel like I'm supposed to do as we conclude the weekend. So we only have so much time together, and I only know you so well. Truthfully, you only know me so well. You build up a bit of a rapport with a group when you stand in front of them and you look them in the eye for several hours and you watch the impact that the Word has on them. And you watch the Holy Spirit go to work. This is a great privilege that I have is to get to watch the Holy Spirit go to work in people and, and do beautiful things. And some people cry and some people laugh and some people fall asleep. And, and that's okay too. I, I really mean that. that I'm not, I don't get offended at all. I feel like some people... Listen, we, we live in a world... We spend, we spend about $40 million a year in the United States trying to fall asleep at night. And that's just on the drugs. And that's not on anything else. So the reality is, I don't know about Canada, but the reality is people have a hard time resting. So if people come into the house of the Lord and they hear a word and it helps them fall asleep, I just say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I do. So I, I've never condemned people, jumped them. I won't slap you and yell at you, embarrass you. <laughs> just slip off into unconsciousness. I believe that the words, I believe, and I mean this, I believe that the words that are coming in are going to do work. Yeah. And so I think you, I, I think setting underneath good news is a far better way to fall asleep than watching a horror flick or pumping yourself full of drugs and then passing out and then just wondering what happened. I, wouldn't it be much better to fall asleep beneath the fountain of the spirit? So rest, rest on. I, I know that's a dangerous way to open a sermon because I can look up in 20 minutes and 90% of you are gone. And I... And, and that teaches me something as a speaker that it's time to take it to the next level, maybe, you know, introduce something. But um, you do, you build a rapport, you, you get a little back and forth, and, and in some ways we're just throwing seed out there. And that's really all we have time to do. You don't have time to cultivate real relationships, and I don't have time to really get to know you. And you don't have time to really get to know me. Well, what we do is we reach into the bag, that bag that if I'm listening is being filled with good news and something valuable and something worth your time. And we, we mix that with a little life experience and personal style and the way we like to talk and deliver. And we just throw it. And that's really what we're doing is we're just tossing out there with this hopeful expectation that some of that is meeting you in a moment of relevance. The beauty is, is we get it. I get a little feedback and I'm, you know, we get a little, I've gotten some feedback this week of, wow, that moment right there was my moment of practicality where the gospel became real and something clicked inside of me and maybe this light comes on. And, then, and what I love about this is that some will walk out and really, in a certain ways, never really be the same again. And that is an amazing thing that you could pull that off in five seconds because it was just a throwing out there and then... To your life to literally be changed this is an awesome thing. So whether we know one another or not, whether we've built a great rapport when we know one another's character, what we, what, what we do have is, is we have one more chance here to throw that seed out there and really send you out. Because when you have the Sunday service, then you go face the week. Okay? And in most cases, you don't come back for two or three days. And let's be honest, a lot of us don't have the time even to come back in two or three days. We might come back in seven days and maybe not even seven and we'd be here in a week, two weeks or three weeks, but we get sent out into the world. So I was praying about that. Like you send this group out. They don't really know you and you don't really know them, but you want to put something in them one more time. What would you do? What would you say? I mean, what else can we say? So I began to think about Jesus doing that to his disciples. One of the most common one is Jesus saying, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we, we call that the Great Commission. And most of us don't feel like we... I don't think most of us take that every day and feel like we're still be going out winning the lost, but 
maybe we should, maybe that should be our commission day, day to day, but I wanted something else. And so the, the Holy Spirit drew me to something. And I think we just flashed up against this last night. Cause I go to, we get out a lot. I throw a lot of stuff out of the bag that I didn't reach into the bag intending to grab, you know? You've, if you've heard one of my sermons, you've realized that sometimes 50% of it, you know, wasn't in the book. Not this book, my, the, but my little book. Like, I didn't write that down to say. So I think last night we mentioned what, what I want to read this morning about as wise as serpent, as harmless as doves. I, I talked about how your kids need that talent. It's going to go out into a world. So I was praying about how do we close, and that was what I felt like. I could see Jesus standing in front of his disciples and they recognize him as this wonderful, meek, beautiful, gentle, perfect shepherd. And the shepherd looks at his group of sheep and he says to them, I'm going to send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Go get them. <laughs> and I thought, what an amazing moment. Can you imagine that moment? Read that, or look at that with me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out. As sheep in the midst of wolves, therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues, and you'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, don't worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it is not you who speaks but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. That's an awesome thing. Wisdom. I think this is a fascinating text. Start with the fact that you have a shepherd with a bunch of sheep. And he says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. That, if you're a good shepherd, sounds like a mistake. I mean, you spend your life as a shepherd protecting sheep from wolves, right? That's your whole job. You get sheep from point A to point B. You're really taking them from birth to market. And all the points in between. Fortunately, we don't have a shepherd who's out to market us and slaughter us because the beauty of the cross is our shepherd was slaughtered on our behalf so that the sheep need not be slaughtered. And so in, in context, Jesus, as the good shepherd, takes us and he blesses us with his life and with his sacrificial death and with his resurrection, but... In this moment where Jesus sends us out, he says, I send you as sheep in the midst of wolves. It is a shepherd taking a group of sheep and running them out to the predator. Because the wolf spends his life trying to find and seek and kill and destroy a group of sheep. So it seems counterproductive then to send sheep into the midst of wolves. I think this scripture is so fascinating because it is so real. We know at a really deep level that we live in a predatory world full of wolves that not everybody around us notices how cute we are as sheep, right? Not everybody recognizes our value as the sons of God. Not everybody appreciates the price that's been paid for us. And maybe we sense that people do in church or our services. But then when we go out into the world, it becomes evident that people don't see us the way we've been taught to see us. People don't treat us the way we've been taught to treat other sheep. Instead, we go into a world full of wolves. And Jesus wanted to make sure you knew exactly who he was talking about because he opens verse 17 with, beware of men. He doesn't say beware of the devil. He says beware of men. So when he says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, he's talking about this world and the way people will treat you and the way they will talk to you and the way you are then to respond to them. And what is the way that you are to respond to them? And this is the fascinating, beautiful paradox is the similes, the two similes Jesus puts together. Two animals that cannot coexist. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Here's the Greek, a little closer to the Greek. Shrewd like a snake. Innocent like a dove. They're two opposite animals. You don't, you don't put a snake and a dove in the same cage. Not unless you just want snake. <laughs> I mean, if your end result is, I've got two animals, I only need one, put them up both in the same cage, guess which one you're going to have? Snake. He'll figure out a way, right? I mean, most of the time, put two in a, in a cage and you're going to end up with just snake. They're going to figure out a way. They're shrewd. 
And so Jesus takes two things completely opposite and puts them into the character of his people. And a lot of people really struggle with the wisest serpents because we look at snakes in such a bad light in the Bible because how'd the book of Genesis get going? I mean, you know, God drops man into a garden and what's the animal that walks up and starts talking? Well, there's that snake. And then we've got this snake throughout the Bible that is nipping at the heels of man putting his poison into the human family. And we get to Revelation and the devil's even called a snake, that old serpent. Well, don't take every simile to mean that every characteristic applies. If you see a really fast runner and you say, that guy's like a cheetah, nobody thinks you mean he's yellow with spots and has a tail. <laughs> what do they think you mean? That guy's fast. Now, why did you say he's like a cheetah? Because people think cheetah fast. They don't think cheetah tail. Does a cheetah have a tail? Yes, but the simile works with speed. So when Jesus says, be as wise as a serpent, he isn't saying, rip people off, fill them with venom, nip at their heels, hide in the weeds and wait on your chance to strike. He's using the simile that makes the most relevant sense to his sheep, the one they need to survive if they're going to live in the middle of wolves. I mean, if a sheep's going to survive in the middle of wolves, he needs a characteristic not normal to sheep. He needs to be slick like a snake. He needs the shrewdness to be able to slither his way out of some confrontations. He needs the shrewdness to know how not to kill wolves. His job is not to kill wolves. Why? Because he has a contrasting quality. What's the contrasting quality? Be as wise as servants. Be as harmless or gentle or innocent as a dove. Well, that's a tough thing to put together. But if you could put those two characteristics into one being, what a being you'd have. What you'd have is someone who could navigate predatory waters, someone who could face wolves and not attack them, but not be destroyed by them. Someone who could show gentle innocence and mercy when need be and when necessary, who definitely could show such gentleness, mercy, and grace to his fellow sheep, wouldn't treat, be trying to get ahead of them and make sure they die and he doesn't because he'd have a harmless as dove nature, but he would also be shrewd and he wouldn't allow himself to be overtaken by the wolf. He would be able to function in a world in which not everybody believed in him, but it wouldn't matter because he knew who he was and he was shrewd like the snake and had the ability to make it from one place to the next place, navigating himself through the world. When Jesus sends us out as sheep in the midst of wolves, he sends us out with the command that I want you in your day-to-day -day walk not to become the wolf. And that's going to be the great temptation that's going to be laid out to you from this world because the system of this world is going to teach you that only the strong survive and that if you're going to make it in this world, you're going to have to do a few things that look a little bit worldly. And I disagree. And I think we've been lied to by the enemy for too long because we've been surrendering our kingdom identity as the sons of God so that we can function in a world that believes you can get ahead in other ways. And it's not the place that you call your primary home. You see, it is not your job to beat the wolf. It's not your job to eat the wolf. It's not your job to become the wolf. It's not your job to become a killer. You survive in a world full of killers, but you're a sheep in the midst of those wolves. You have a difference that you can make in this kingdom and in this world. I said this the other night. I want to repeat this and bring this back. I, I, I feel like we've almost surrendered some of the better qualities of humanity on the planet so that we can have other qualities of security. I, I, I don't know that we've ever lived in a time, and I've only lived in 41 years, so I can't speak for the whole of human history, but I don't know that we've ever lived in a time where the love of money was so great, where the thought of financial security was so foremost on the minds of people that it actually drove their day-to-day -day decisions every moment of every day. I think some of our previous generations had survival on their mind. In the, in the, in, uh, why wouldn't they? I mean, food wasn't always easy to come by. You didn't always have a long life expectancy. It was all about staying alive, keep breathing, keep moving. But I think we now have such a love for stuff and I think we've kind of jaded the line between wants and needs. In fact, if I went around the room, I think most of us, if we were being honest, we don't even really know the difference in wants and needs because we would tell ourselves that a lot of the stuff we want are the same things as the things we think we need. Well, I have to have that. 
And then if we did inventory, we would realize that none of that stuff keeps us alive. We would survive just fine without it. And we've jaded the line between wants and needs. And what that has done in some ways has helped us just walk over into the predatory world of the wolf who's going to do anything and everything they have to do to achieve everything they think that they need, even though a lot of it's just wants. And we've even surrendered some of our own qualities of being sheep so that we can go after some of the things the wolf goes after. And if we have to step on people and people have to fall behind, well, that's just all part of the experience because you're not going to get ahead in this world unless you do X, Y, and Z. Now, Jesus knew you were going out into a world where the wolves were going to treat sheep that way. So he said, you're going to have to be shrewd. You're going to have to be wise. It's not about being shrewd so you can nip the wolf in the heel. It's going to have to be shrewd and be wise to remain sheep. Please hear that. You are being challenged to be as wise as a serpent, not to become a wolf. You're being challenged to be wise as a serpent, to remain a sheep in the middle of wolves. That is not easy to do. It is not easy to remain sheep-like when everybody around you wants to destroy you. You've been given great power. You've been given great authority. And with that comes the need for the Holy Spirit to exhibit inside of us Great self-control. How could it not? Remember when Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth? That's one of the opening frames of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5. Five chapters in front of this. I would read that for many years and I just so disagreed with Jesus. Now, if you'll be really honest with yourself, maybe you disagree with him too. Maybe you just never said you disagree with Jesus. Maybe we don't feel like that's appropriate to say. I don't know. I kind of feel like we should be honest. God's a big boy. He can handle all of your questions. Okay? If you ever have a question of the word, you say, I don't understand your nature. I don't know why you're doing this. Ask him. God's not going to get mad at you. I mean, if God's really God, he loses nothing when you question him. He loses none of his identity. He loses none of his self-confidence. And he doesn't have lightning bolts on deck waiting to strike down stupid questions. No. Thank God, because when you know who you are, you don't, you don't lose the identity of who you are because others don't believe it. So ask him, so I, you know, what in the world the meek inherit the earth? Because what's meek? I mean, Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And so most of us look at meek as gentle and passive. Dare I say, bit of a pushover. Right? I mean, that guy's meek. He can just, you know, just shove him and... Then run over him. So when Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth, we go, well, I don't know how that's going to work because I live in a world full of wolves. And when you live in a world full of wolves, what do wolves do to the meek? Yeah. Oh, wolves hunt the meek. They, they're predatory. They wait for that guy. Well, maybe they do if we have a misunderstanding of the word meek because meek doesn't mean gentle and pushover and waffling and weak. See, somewhere along the way, we lost that original thought in the Greek of what meek means. In the classic Greek writing, when they would write the word meek, they used it in a military term. And what meek meant, and this might change your perspective forever about whether you want to be meek or not. It might also change your perspective forever about a meek Jesus and why the meek inherit the earth. It was a military term. It was a man who held a sword. And meek was the word that meant those who have a sword but know how to keep it sheathed. The man who has the power and knows how not to use it. We never think in those terms. When we think power, we think about how to use it, which is cheap. That's a cheap way to think. It's easy. You got power, wield it. Difficult way to think is you've got power, hold on to it. That's tough. Because holding on to it takes a level of self-restraint most of us don't know. Because we think if I had the control, you know what I'd do right now? If I had the power to do it, what would you do? Well, thank God you don't suddenly get the power. Right? I've thought that many times. Boy, if I could do this right now. And I've heard the voice of the Spirit going, that's why you don't have any power. Because you, son, are not meek. Oh, you mean I'm not gentle? No, I mean you don't know how to leave the sword in, the, in its scabbard. You, you would pull the thing. 
You get a chance, you'd slit throats because you want people to get what's coming to them. And they hit you, you're going to hit them back. Bless God, how's the world ever going to know how strong we are if we don't smack them back? <laughs> Jesus takes his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way in, he says, well, for the journey ahead, you might want to get a sword. Peter has one. The Lord says, that's enough. <clears throat> now hear this. So I read that for a long time ago. Now, if you're Peter and the Lord told you to go buy a sword, what do you think you're going to do? That's right. Why wouldn't you? If the Lord, I mean, if God, if Jesus walks up to you and goes, you need to go buy, you need to go buy a gun. <laughs> what would you think? I'm going to shoot somebody. <laughs> but never forget this. He made you sheep in the midst of wolves, wise as serpent, and harmless as doves. Don't ever lose the last half of that because you're drunk with power on what you have and you want to wield the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if you lose that last half of it, you'll just start to take on the DNA of a wolf. And you're better than that. So listen carefully. Because sheep walk in. Jesus said, go buy a sword. They get in the middle of Gethsemane and a bunch of soldiers come up to arrest Jesus. And what does Peter do? He pulls his sword out and he cuts his servant's ear off. And what does Jesus say? Good job, Peter. That's why I told you to buy the sword. No. Jesus reaches over, picks up the servant's ear, puts it back on his head, turns to Peter and says, permit even this. Listen, Jesus told Peter to buy a sword, not because he wanted him to learn how to use it. He told him to buy a sword because he wanted him to learn how not to. Because that's how you teach people to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in the midst of predatory wolves. So you have great power, but with that great power comes great responsibility. If you don't know how to learn how to leave that sword sheathed, you're never going to be able to navigate yourself through this world. Now, every time I mention something like this, I know the questions that stir because people walk up to you later and go, well, when's the right time to swing the sword? When do we ever? Because it's almost in our heart to want to use that sword. We can't wait for the moment where we get to pull that sword out and stab somebody. And I'll be honest with you, I can't find the time in Jesus' ministry. I mean, I've read the Gospels my whole life. I can't find the time in Jesus' ministry where he tells you to pull the sword. The closest I can get is Jesus tells the story and he says, if you were at home and you knew the strong man was going to come and rob your house, you would stay home and guard your goods. It sounds to me like there's a moment where Jesus says, okay, you can defend the house. But Jesus never lets you become a predator. And Jesus never lets you fight back. Just because you've been verbally abused. Just because you've been wronged in a way or two. And the Apostle Paul picked it up and we ignore it. We act like this never even happened in Corinthians. Paul writes the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians and he opens with, I hear that Christians are suing Christians in secular court. Why would you go before unbelievers and let them judge you? Don't you know that you're going to judge angels? And then this little nugget that never gets preached and no one writes a book on. Why could you not just allow yourselves to be wronged? Paul says... Why could you not, hear it again, we got to hear it again. Why could you not just allow yourselves to be wronged? I'm not going to allow myself to be wronged. There's a legal system out there. I'm going to go defend myself. The Apostle Paul says, if you want to take yourself down 10 rungs to do that, go for it. But you're one of the sons of God. He closes the chapter by saying, don't you know your body's the temple? You literally are the house of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be walking around predatory wolves like a sheep in the midst of them, wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. Keep the sword sheathed. The meek will inherit that earth. You'll be able to step your foot on with a possession because you know what you have and you know how not to use power in the wrong way. We talked about this a little bit yesterday morning when we talked about Paul closing 2 Corinthians 13 and he says you can use this, this for edification or destruction. Remember that? You can speak to people and edify them. You can speak to people and destroy them. The option is yours. What does a serpent do? Well, I don't want to go through all of the slithering and all the biting and all the venom. Again, I don't think every simile needs to be used to its max. Jesus obviously wasn't telling you to be snake-like in your dealings and slippery and hard to get a hold of and people don't trust you anymore. No, but be wise. Know how to navigate through a world full of wolves. It's not about being ignorant. It's not about being stupid. It's not about being passive. It's about understanding the power that you have, knowing what you can do with it. But what a snake does so well is avoid snares and traps. How does he do it? Well, he thinks like a snake. So if you're going to be a sheep in the midst of wolves, you're going to have to avoid snares and traps. 
because the enemy is going to put up snares and traps for you everywhere. You're going to have a lot of them. The greatest snare that I see in the New Testament is not the enemy getting you to watch something and say something and do something and wear something and go somewhere. That's what the church concentrated on for a long, long time. The only traps we knew were visual. I don't think that's the trap the enemy needs. I think the best trap the enemy has is getting you to let go of your identity. Because if he can get you to forget that you're one of the sons of God, he can rob you blind of everything you own. Okay, because if you forget you're one of the sons of God, the only thing left is you must be one of the sons of the earth. If you're one of the sons of the earth, the only way to govern yourself is like a wolf. And if you want to go down that road, the enemy's already won. Because you've already surrendered the power that you, you know you have. You've already become something you're not. And if that's the case, he can destroy you and he can do it pretty easily. In fact, you're really just dead meat. You're not even really that big of a deal. I mean, if you step outside of being one of the sons of God, what do you have? You're just a cog in the machine, man. You're just like anything else. Easy to destroy. As one of the sons of God, you hold great power and great authority. You, you know how to hold things back, but you know how to do what you need to do. You know how to navigate yourself through the world. So if you can lose the identity of sonship, that's what, that's what the snake goes to work on on Jesus in the wilderness. Okay? Please remember that when Jesus goes into the wilderness, he's going into the wilderness to repeat the story of Israel and get right what they got wrong. Can I, let me take a, I'll call it 60 seconds and then be there six minutes. Let me take a 60 second diversion here for a second. You remember when Jesus comes to the Jordan River and he says to John the Baptist, you need to baptize me. And John says, I can't baptize you. You got to baptize me. You're better than I am. And Jesus says, this must be done so we can fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus, John dips Jesus down the water and Jesus comes up and the Holy Spirit comes down like what? Like a dove. There's a reason for that. It's not a, it's not a raven. It's not an eagle. It's not a hawk. It's not a bird of prey, it's a dove, and it gently sets on him as a form of the Holy Spirit. And the, you, the voice speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Last words Jesus hears as he walks away, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And he walks into a wilderness. Okay? He's led of the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. He walks into the wilderness and he spends how long? 40 days and 40 nights. And he fasts while he's there 40 days and 40 nights. He fasts so that he can get to his weakest point as a human being. Because at his absolute weakest point, we're going to die on day 41. Most... Human beings go about 40 days without food. That's if they started fairly healthy and they can drink water along the way. So you get to that 40th day, there's nothing left, absolutely depleted, and here comes the snake. What Jesus is doing is reimagining the story that the Old Testament told us that we got wrong. Because he had to fulfill all righteousness. Israel gets baptized in the Red Sea and goes 40 years into the wilderness and faces off with the enemy. Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan and goes 40 days. He don't have time to go 40 years. He goes 40 days into the wilderness to square off with the enemy. First, Adam and Eve meet a snake in a garden, and the snake talks to them about their identity. Won't you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? God knows if you eat it, you'll be like God. She was already like God. It's a questioning of her identity. Jesus walks into the wilderness, meets a snake. First words out of the snake's mouth. If thou be the son of God, turn the stones to bread. Why wouldn't you? You're hungry. You've got that kind of power. What would it hurt? Right? What would it hurt? Now, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to, to go. I've done that in other sermons. I'm not here to go through all of the steps of what happens. I just wanted to show you that moment right there where Jesus is confronted with his identity. If you are the Son of God. Because if he surrenders his identity, if he does that right there, then the Son of God can be controlled by the wolf. Okay? And the Son of God circumvents all of God's other provision to have His temporary needs met. And there's a lot of that going on in some of our lives where we circumvent the long-term benefits of following the Spirit so we can have a temporary gratification satisfaction in our lives. And it's the sons of God acquiescing to the demands of the wolf. And we're supposed to be wise as serpents. So Jesus outsmarts the serpent because he never gives up his identity. And that's the greatest trap the enemy's ever going to lay for you, is to give up your identity. To think you are something other than what the Bible says that you are. Romans chapter 16. Run there with me real quick. Romans chapter 16, verse number 19. Paul says this in his closing remarks to the church at Rome. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good 
and simple concerning evil. That word simple is, is bad. That makes us look less than intelligent. It's not the right word out of the Greek either. Your obedience has become the known to all. Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. I want you to be wise in what's good and I want you to be innocent. It's the better word in the Greek concerning evil. This sounds a lot like Matthew 10, doesn't it? it? Sounds a lot like what Jesus said when he said, be wise as a servant, harmless as a dove. Paul recreates that as he closes his letter to the Romans. And he says, I want you to be wise concerning the good things. I want you to be innocent concerning the evil things. Verse 20, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The word Satan here is borrowed from the Hebrew, the Hebrew word ha-satan. This is why we capitalize the S on Satan. It's not because we're giving respect to the devil, but because in the Hebrew, ha-satan is the way it's spelled, ha being the, the Satan. And the, the writers title it because it's not just an individual, it's any voice of accusation. It's the, that's what, that's what satan means, Satan, accuser, accusation. Any voice of accusation is the Satan. Don't think of Satan as this figure that runs around, you know, bouncing house to house trying to see if he can possess your kids. The ha Satan, the Satan, is any voice of accusation. It's that which accuses you of being less than you are. Yeah. That which, and that, that can come through your family. Amen. Your family can be Satan to you. I didn't mean your families are possessed of Satan. But they are speaking the spirit of the Antichrist. They're speaking the spirit of the Hasatan. They are saying to you voices of accusation. They are speaking to you things that are not about who you are and your true identity. I think eschatologically this has impact in the 16th chapter of Romans, the same way the 10th chapter of Matthew does, because I, Matthew is a book written primarily to the Jewish audience about events that are going to transpire in their generation. And so when Jesus said, I send you out, be wise as serpent and harmless as doves, he was talking to a specific group of people that were going to go need to survive in a generation that was going to kill a bunch of them. And they did. How many of you know a lot of the disciples would lose their lives? Heads on chopping blocks, stoned to death, sawed in half, all kinds of gruesome ways to die. And they did it for Christ. They did it because of the testimony that they had. Now, most of us aren't facing that kind of persecution. We're still facing the need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And Romans 16 is also facing a people about to face that same thing. He says, Satan's going to be crushed under your feet shortly. And I believe that that experientially happened in the lives of the Romans, but I believe it can experientially happen in the lives of those in this building. Because as we become wise to what is good and we become simple or we become innocent to what is evil, the accuser gets crushed under our feet. Notice it's the God of peace that crushes Satan under our feet. The God of peace this is characterized by understanding that sheep walking in the midst of a bunch of wolves, sheep walking in a place where wolves are predators, when we walk into the peace of understanding who we are in the midst of that, the accuser gets silenced in our lives. So there's always an accuser. There's always a voice. There's always something being silenced. All right, dove imagery. Go to Philippians 2. I'm headed. Remember a moment ago we talked about the, the dove coming down at Jordan and resting on Jesus and it wasn't an eagle and it wasn't a raven and it wasn't a hawk. It wasn't a predatory or a, a bird that eats carrion, dead animals, dead bodies. It was, it was the little cooing dove. And the image we get of Jesus out of the gate in the book of John can be a little disturbing, especially if we think God's supposed to be super masculine and knock stuff over all the time. You know? Bible tells you in John that Jesus came from the bosom of the Father. Hebrew word it uses there is the same word for breast that it uses on a woman. Greek word there. Pulls from the Hebrew. Jesus came from the breast of his Father. And you go, well, that's weird. Father doesn't have breast. Well, God has within him the qualities of male and female. Otherwise, where'd women come from? I mean, ladies, you're not some sort of accident. I don't care what the church has taught you about. Listen, the whole subservient thing, you should be subservient to men. Whatever men say is what should go. Why do, we, why do we treat that in the Bible like it's a moral imperative? Remember when God says to Eve in the book of Genesis, your desire shall be to your husband. Remember that? And then we act like that's a moral imperative, like God says that's, that's how to be moral. No, that was the curse. Remember? 
Adam and Eve sin. And then God puts curses. And the curse for women is you're going to be morally subservient to your husband and you're going to have much pain in childbearing. Much pain in childbearing has a much deeper meaning than it's going to hurt to have kids. Much pain in childbearing means your heart's going to break for them. It's going to break over and it's going to break over and it's going to break over and it's going to break over again. So it's going to make you mom. And that's part of that curse. And that curse can be lifted because Christ went to the cross as the curse for us. I think that's pretty good news. Now you do that with that what you will. That's a freebie. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove. It makes more sense if he descends like an eagle. It makes more, des- makes more sense if he runs in like a lion. I mean, wouldn't that be more powerful? But here you got Jesus coming out of his dad's breast and cooing like a dove. <laughs> you go... What message is God trying to send? I'll tell you the message God's trying to send. I'm going to send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. You've got to be wise as serpents, but I want you to be harmless as doves. Because I'm going to put you back in a garden, and in that garden is going to be a beautiful experience. We're going to grow together in that garden. The innocent side of us is something we should not suppress and something we should not turn off. It's something we should embrace. It's something we should show forth. And men, men in particular, we have a difficulty with this because... To bear our innocence is to bear an emotional side of us that a lot of us have tried to keep shielded and a lot of us have tried to keep suppressed because we think it makes us weak. And that's because we don't understand Jesus. We don't understand the physiology of Jesus and we don't understand the psychology of Jesus and we don't understand why He was here and what He was here for. It wasn't about making men weak, but we are exposed through the fact that we are harmless as doves to the side of us that can be empathetic. You can be strong and empathetic at the same time. In fact, it makes a much better leader. I mean, a leader with no empathy doesn't know how anybody feels that's following him and doesn't care. It's not sympathy. Sympathy is just feeling sorry for people. Empathy is understanding why they feel the way that they feel and feeling a little bit of it with them. Paul grabbed hold of it to the Romans and said, cry with those that cry. Laugh with those that laugh. Why did he say that? Be empathetic. Be innocent like a dove. Realize that other people feel and they hurt and they have pain. It's not your moral obligation to have pain with them, but understand why they hurt and why they have pain and why they think the way that that they do. Guys, this is going to take a little bit of mental effort. We're going to have to work on this because we live in a very divided world socially, economically, politically, culturally, and we don't like the thoughts, feelings, and opinions of the other side. We think they're all wrong and stupid. That's our nature. We watch to have our side reinforced. And then when we change the channel to the other side, we go, look at how much of a liar they are. Look at how stupid they are. This is all, nobody's telling the truth over here. And we have lost any empathy to realize why someone might believe the way they they do. And I'm not saying that everything on the other side is right. But let's be honest, is everything on our side right? Very rarely. Never. (laughs) And empathetic is not the ability to just act like everything you believe doesn't matter, but it's the ability to see what's happening on the other side and realize that there's pain and there's a reason for that pain. Jesus was awesome at this because he could walk into a room and suffer with somebody who lived a lifestyle he could not possibly understand. He never, was, he never committed adultery, much less when he caught in the act of adultery. Are you kidding? And drug out into the public square to be stoned to death. And yet, a heart of empathy because he could imagine what that might feel like. He could imagine what it might feel like to be... I don't mean this... Forget about what Jesus might have thought for a moment. Can you imagine what it might feel like? What's hard? What might it feel like if your entire background was different, if you were raised in a different home, in a different time, in a different culture? How might you face the world and shape the world through the lens that God gave you if you had X, Y, Z in your life instead of A, B, C? The ability to reach old and grab that is the innocence of the dove. The the ability to hold on to that and realize that that, that there are other people with other feelings and other hopes and other pains and other desires. This is one of the things I pray for the most in ministry. I don't ask the Lord to anoint me. That's a moot point. God doesn't take the anointing away. 
So I don't ever get in prayer and go, Lord, will you anoint me tonight? I'm already anointed and the word is definitely anointed. And so I just get up and say, I got a gift. And I don't even ask the Lord for sermons very much anymore. I did here a while back and he said, I don't care what you preach. What do you like? <laughs> I mean it. I, it. And so what I do is I say, Lord, this, this is on my heart. Is there anywhere you can lead me? And man, wow. He can say, yeah, let's go. Because I want you to preach what's on your heart. So you can preach what's on your heart. And, and I do believe the Lord puts things there. Absolutely. But I've stopped going to him begging and go, you know, oh, I don't know what I'm going to preach tomorrow. I just go to bed. <laughs> I mean, I've done my, I mean, I've read, I know the book and I know the crowd and I know where it's got. So I just, that kind of happened a little bit last night. And then early this morning, I knew, hey, this is what I want to read. And this is what I think, I, I believe the Lord will give me some stuff. And some of it, he's going to give me up live because just speak my heart out and let that go. But that's, I don't pray about the anointing. I don't pray a whole lot about getting sermons. I pray to feel what you feel. And I pray that all the time. I pray to be able to see things the way you see them. Because it will make me a better teacher and it will make me a better man. Because I need to be able to see what my son sees. I need to be able to see what my daughter sees. It will make me a better father. I need to be able to see what my wife sees. It will make me a better husband. I need to be able to see what she needs. I need to be able to see how she feels. And a lot of this is going to require me to open my mouth and ask hard questions. You're going to have to start having conversations with the people we love. Tough, straight up, honest conversations. A lot of us are going outside of our marriage for fulfillment because we're not communicating honestly with the person God gave us till we die. So we're stepping outside of the marriage to go get wants, needs, and desires fulfilled because my spouse doesn't want to talk like that. Well, then it's time to grow up. Because we didn't get in this to playhouse, we got in this so we could live till we die together. And so you go, well, I don't know if I can talk about that with my kids. Then it's time to be a parent and talk about it with your kids and your grandchildren. Because there's an innocence of being a dove and a shrewdness of being a serpent. And you better use both sides of that coin because they're yours. Otherwise, you're going to raise a house full of predators and wolves. And you're going to bed up with them because they're not being honest. And it's time to stop lying to ourselves about where we are in life. And it's time to stop lying to our spouse about what we expect out of life and marriage and sexuality and our time together and our conversations and our intimacy. Should we talk about this in church? Absolutely. The fact that we're not talking about it is why we are repressed in the body of Christ. I don't mean that we're suppressed by the world. I mean we're repressed in our minds of thinking about the things that make us truly human. I mean, I spent decades in the church and never heard anybody talk about pornography. Never. Not one time. Not one time. Because it was so taboo to even mention yep. sexuality. Like, if you mention that, well, then the Holy Ghost is going to leave. Because he's all about getting people saved. Well, I disagree. I don't think the Holy Spirit leaves when we start talking. This is real stuff to people. Yep. It's real issues. You got men watching pornography because they, they need to be visually stimulated. Sometimes they're not getting anything at home. Sometimes they are getting something at home, but every time they're not communicating their desires. They're not communicating their wants. They're not communicating their, disease, their needs. So they go feed something inside of them that's cheap and easy to feed, but is completely unfulfilling. You got the other gender that doesn't understand why the guy's doing it at all because his wife sees that he has to do it in secret. And the fact that he's doing it in secret makes her believe that there's something deficient about her, the way she looks, the way she moves the way she treats him, and so she feels guilty. And this circle goes on. And it could stop if we had a conversation. Yeah. And it would help if we talked to our young men in church about it. Yeah. And said, part of this is because you're a young man and you have this need to see things visually. And it's time that you learn how to harness that within the power of the finished work and understand who Christ is in you and what Christ can do in you. Boy, that's a big can of worms, ain't it? Just, just rip the lid off of that one. Did we solve anything there? No, we didn't solve anything. Who do we think we are? We're not going to solve it. I mean, we're not going to solve it, but we've got to talk about it. And we've got to start taking it to the cross. And we've got to start having conversations with one another about the things that matter in our lives. About how we're raising our children, how we're spending our money, not having to go to therapy and then find out how your spouse feels. Why is it we don't learn what they were thinking until we sit on a couch and tell a stranger? 
That's bizarre. I didn't know you felt that way. Why did it take us paying this guy? I'm not cutting down the therapist. Dear Lord, some people need to find one. I mean, absolutely. You need to write that check. But have the conversation before you get there would help. And keep having the conversation and keep discussing it. There's a wisdom of the serpent we need to have. There's an innocent of the dove we need to have. And you put them both together, you have a sheep that can navigate wolf waters. And when you get that sheep, you found God's man in the earth. I can promise you, you found God's woman in the earth. You found somebody to make a difference on the planet. You found somebody to make an impact. We all brag about being kingdom people. And a lot of us aren't using the wisdom of the snake and we're not using the innocence of the dove. We're just using scripture. And we got our theology and our eschatology right, but we don't have our practice down. You're talking about kingdom all day long. Show me that you're wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. I'll start listening to your version of the kingdom. So I get this a lot from theological armchair quarterbacks, man. Schol- Monday morning scholars that heard a sermon on Sunday want to clean it up, put 10 verses on top of it, start talking about the kingdom and eschatology. I go, listen, I'll listen to your kingdom talk if you're wise as a snake and harmless as a dove. But if all you've got is 20 verses you went and read out of somebody's book, that's not the kingdom. That's philosophical theology. But in practice, you're a sheep walking around among wolves. I want to see if you've been getting snipped. And I want to see how you fight back. Because if you really understand what it means to be a sheep, your life's not about attack everything you disagree with. Your life's not about going out and proving everybody wrong. Because that's not how sheep navigate wolves. Try that if you're a sheep. Try to go attack the wolf. See how that handles. <laughs> See how that works out for you. We're not in attack mode. Philippians 2. Man, i got to hurry. What was all that about? <laughs> hey, man, there's something there. There's something there. Listen, I, I meant what I said a moment ago. I don't, I don't get up here and claim I can solve problems, but I have decided that I'm going to be honest enough to start asking a few questions that maybe you'll talk about in the car. And if we start talking about some stuff in the car and then maybe talk about it at home, maybe somebody bring it back in and say, what's the Lord think about this? We might get somewhere. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do all, this is tough. Everybody ready for this? All right, 99 of, out of 100 are going to like this. In fact, none of us are going to like it. The one that says they like it lying. <laughs> do all things without complaining and disputing that's the 14th verse Ooh, that's my power that's, the, that's my verse for living right there say so, so what's your favorite verse in the Bible I've never in my life heard anybody say you know what my favorite verse in the Bible is Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 do all things without complaining and without disputing that's my power verse that gets me through the day it actually would Hear me. It actually would help you get through the day. Sometimes we ought to pick this verses like this. Put your hands to the plow. Do it without complaining and without disputing. What kind of a world might you live in if you navigated the wolf by moving forward without complaining and without disputing? Because I'm about to show you where this is going. Paul sets you up. He's great at that. He sets you up with this verse that nobody likes. I mean, who likes that? Complaining and disputing... We take pride in complaining and disputing. What do you, suppress it? I want more of it. I want to complain. I don't like my job. I want to tell you how much I don't like my job. I don't, I, I, I don't like traffic. I don't I can tell you how much I don't like traffic. <laughs> disputing, straight up arguing. We love it. We're going to find somebody to argue politics with. We're going to find somebody to argue medicine with. We're going to find somebody to argue theology with. We're going to find, it's just that we love, it just get, we get off on it, man. We just get, the, it's like a drug. <laughs> that you may become blameless and harmless. Thank you. Oh, man. You know, you know the word harmless? There's the word innocent. It's, it's the innocent dove word. That you become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. This was Paul's sheep in the midst of wolves verse. This is Paul going, do what you do without complaining or without grumbling so that you as children of God can shine like lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Or as I like to say it, it sounds a lot like Jesus said it. Do what you do without grumbling and complaining. Do it with the wisdom of the serpent because the serpent knows when to shut his mouth. 
Do it with the innocence of a dove, and when you do, you will be as the children of God who shine forth like sheep in the midst of a bunch of predatory wolves. They look different. They move different. They talk different. They govern themselves. They orient themselves differently. And what might they do? They might shine. Look at the last of this 15th verse. They might shine as lights in the world. 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. I'd like to think I haven't run in vain or labored in vain at a weekend in Wallaceburg, Canada. Amen. I'd like to think that I have not labored in vain at tossing seed into the ground. I'd like to think that I've just spoke to a bunch of sheep who are going to be released in a little bit to go out into a world full of wolves. And they will shine like lights because they will remember that they are the children of God. And being the children of God, they will govern and orient themselves as wise as a snake but as harmless as a dove. They'll hold on to the sword handle and most of the time they'll keep it sheathed because great power and great responsibility are married and come together and that's what God's children look like. They'll inherit the earth they live in because their meekness will shine forth like the sun and everywhere they step their foot will be their possession because they've learned how to navigate themselves in wolf waters. They've learned how to navigate themselves in a world that doesn't care anything for them and doesn't love them. But they've become a light in the midst of absolute stingent darkness. They're making a difference in their world because when people look at them, it's not that they see someone they can idolize. It's not that they see someone to make a mentor out of. It's that they see someone who reminds them even for a brief flashing moment of what it might look like to see Jesus. He might be that kind. He might be that gentle. He might be that loving. He might be that forgiving. He might be that gracious. He might be that merciful. And if we could shine forth that on our street and on our school and in our homes and in our marriage and with our children and in our churches, we might make the world a little less terrible place. We might make a difference in a world that desperately needs sheep in the midst of wolves. When Jesus closes that statement, beware of men, or when he transitions that statement, beware of men, he's not telling you not to trust people. I think he's telling you that the navigable waters, the obstacles are going to come from relationships. They're going to come from people. It's not always going to be the demon behind the rock. Sometimes it's going to be the person in the desk next to you. All right? Beware of men means watch those around you. It's not beware and be scared to death of men, but be on the lookout. Be on the watch while you're on this earth. I think beware of men can hold a good connotation as well. Beware, the ones you're supposed to be lights in front of are men. That's not a gender specific statement. It's mankind. Beware, the ones you're supposed to be making the difference on, it's mankind. They are the darkness. You are the light. Go shine forth. Wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. No strings attached. No strings attached. I want to read for you something and I'm, I'm going to close. I was going to open with this, but then I'll close with it. And I just like it. It just blessed my heart. And I thought it might bless your heart as well. Um, this is a letter I received about two weeks ago. And I won't say the person's name and I won't say what city they live in. It was in the U.S. And I'll change just enough words to try to protect the innocent. This guy said, we moved into our city two and a half years ago. Let me start. Let me go back just a bit, okay? Man says, I was working in the yard this week, and I think the Lord gave me an immediate answer to my constant question, why is it taking me so long to completely surrender into grace? I listen to your sermons all the time. Some of your sermons I listen to 15 times. I agree in my spirit with what's being taught. You happen to put my feelings into words, so all that is to say this. A revelation as to why grace needs to be a constant drink for me at my age was revealed to me this past week. We moved to our city two and a half years ago, and we planted two trees in our backyard. One of the trees was leaning, so I tied a heavy string to to it to keep it vertical. And the string was a little bit too low for my height. And I had to bend over a little bit so it wouldn't clip the top of my head as I walked by. Well, two months ago, the tree died and I had to remove it. Now, mind you, the tree and the string were both removed. And every time since then, I've worked in the yard and to this day, I bend over to keep the string that held the tree vertical from hitting my head. I'm still in the habit of ducking for my safety. Today, the revelation of the Lord was clear. 
I've been trained to think a certain way at 82 years of life. And now I have to realize that there is no string. Through your teaching, you've set me free by the revelations you share. I'm so thankful. I just had to share this example of enlightenment on my part as to how people like me need to really take a look at the invisible string or the habits that they are trained to dodge or pay attention to as they walk with the Lord when all along, freedom is there with no strings attached to his presence. That's a good letter. That blessed me. I don't know what your object is, but he loves you with no strings attached. I almost preached no strings attached today. But maybe that little letter will do it justice by itself. Grace and peace to you, church. I send you forth into the world as sheep among wolves. Be ye therefore as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Beware of men. They'll persecute you. They'll scourge you. But don't worry about what you shall say when they bring you before the magistrate, for it won't be you that speaks. It will be the Holy Spirit inside of you. I pray that cultivation has begun this weekend in you, that the Holy Spirit begin to minister and to speak through you. Father, thank you for what you've given us this weekend, and thank you for the help. And laying it in front of your people, thank you for always being faithful to your word and always being faithful to the call. You've anointed and you've helped. And I pray that, Father, it does not end today, but like seed in good ground, this take root, the Holy Spirit begin to cultivate, the Holy Spirit begin to grow in our lives, the things that we need. Father, we've put a lot of food on the table this weekend, and in, as is the case most of the time, a lot of it goes in one ear and out the other because we just can't process it all. But the Holy Spirit is real, and there are things that we have grabbed that we don't even realize we've grabbed. Bring those things back over the coming weeks and months. It doesn't matter if they remember who said it. It doesn't matter if we get credit. It doesn't matter if they quote and use our name. Father, this entire thing is about sheep being in a world of darkness in the midst of a bunch of wolves. Who cares who gets credit as long as the sheep make it through? So we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.